All right, cool. Um, we'll just start it here, and people usually funnel in uh, as we get going. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the community call. This week, we're joined uh, by Medici from Abacus, I think is how you say it. But before we get into that, I want to give a quick reminder that we have three snapshot proposals that are live like right now. Um, I'm pretty sure they like they finish by the time this call is over. So if you're hanging out in here and you haven't voted yet, just make sure to go vote. Yeah, so there's 18 minutes left. Go vote if you haven't already. Um, if you're listening to the recording, you you already missed the vote. So hopefully you voted. Um, we try to cover all of this stuff well in advance on the community calls so that everybody has warning. Um, so I think we actually covered all of these in detail last week. So I won't go over them here. Um, but just really quickly, it's the NFT proposal, the baby butterfly cartel. It's the one about RL butterfly, butterfly emissions, and one about uh, locking aura. So that's the quick TLDR on all those. So just go vote really quickly if you if you haven't. Um, before we get into any other redacted stuff, it'd be cool to start going over some of the advocate stuff while we have while we have Medici here. Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't know anything about NFTs. I'm completely useless when it comes to NFTs and NFT finance. So uh, I'll leave it to Sammy, Sammy and Omnia to ask like all of the questions here. But uh, before we get into those, Medici, do you mind like giving a brief overview of what you guys are building at, at Abacus? Um, yeah. So first off, thanks for having me, guys. Um, second off, the way, so in like the TLDR of Abacus is that it allows anyone to come in and speculate on the value of an NFT um, without actually having to own it. And the way that happens is you come in, there's these things called spot pools, which are basically appraisal vehicles for any amount of NFTs. It could be one NFT, it could be a thousand NFTs for any different amount of collections. And um, those spot pools are chopped up into an amount of tranches, uh, each tranche has a range of value. So, for example, the lowest tranche is 0 to 1 ETH. And that represents the appraisal value that you are attributing to the NFT. So, if you think that an NFT is worth more than 1 Ethereum, then you would be willing to buy into 0 to 1 ETH tranche. Why would you do so? Because you earned some sort of reward in the form of this uh, network token, which is called ABC. What do you get from having that? You get, uh, like we have this curve words dynamic that you can participate in. Um, and you will also be able to receive a revenue share of the entire protocol's revenues paid out in ETH. Um, and so that in short is basically what Abacus is. And then when you take all the appraisers individually coming in and appraising together, you get a much larger system, which basically acts as a massive underwriter and market maker for all NFTs and like attracts liquidity to the space. Dope. And uh, Omnia and Sammy, I'll let you guys take the the questions from here. And then anybody who's listening in, uh, please feel free to drop you know questions in the in the town hall text chat, and we'll work them into the to the conversation. Yeah, this is uh, this is pretty incredible. I mean, Medici and I had a few calls ourselves because. It was it was a lot for me to wrap my head around. So I'm sure there'll be like a lot of questions. But I guess like um, one of the most impressive things to me and one of the key building blocks of Abacus um, that I was most impressed about was the borrowing module or the lending module that you guys have built in house. Do you want to touch a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, sure. So we are we basically. Um, the goal of Abacus is to right, make this world of NFTs a lot more liquid and by doing so, make uh, lending against an NFT much lower risk and you know, any other sort of NFT finance that may pop up much lower risk for the person who's actually um, offering the financial product to the NFT holder. Um, right, and as we see, like the perfect example, perfect case study that's going on right now is um, this whole Ben Dow saga, right? If you're not familiar with it, uh, TLDR of it is that there are a lot of bored apes uh, that are about to be liquidated. Um, 15 mutant apes were just liquidated. I think like 10 doodles have been liquidated all over the past two days. Um, and the reason why this is happening is because when you build an NFT, like a financial um, product on a market where it doesn't have much liquidity, um, 
things go well until they don't. And then when they don't go well, it goes very, very badly. So what we want to show is that, you know, using our solution of appraising things and attributing value to NFTs is superior to using floor price or using some sort of, you know, ML modeling on its face value. Um, and so what we did was to begin, we built out our own uh, lending module for Abacus uh, so that we don't have to wait for others to react and integrate to Abacus uh, for people to be able to realize that kind of the benefit of having Abacus being a backing for some NFTs or uh, providing this liquidity for NFTs. And so this module basically very simple. Um, you're able to come in and borrow at like 95% LTV against your NFT. Um, that LTV is determined by the value in the spot pool. So based on the liquidity locked up by those appraisers. And then you, in order to actually borrow that money, you mint what's called uh, NFT ETH or NETH, uh, which is like a kind of derivative of ETH. And it will always be backed by one, um, one ETH, one like true ETH of value. By always back, that doesn't mean it's pegged to it because it's not pegged. So there may be times where you can't go and get the ETH right away if you're holding this this any. But as an example of how, of how this works and how things will always be uh, claimable for ETH, let's say, uh, you know, let's say Omnia um, wants to borrow 100 ETH against his punk, and he has a punk pool that has 110 ETH in the pool. So Omnia comes to this lending module and mints 95 any, um, and then Omnia goes and pays Sammy that 95 any for another board ape, right? So now Sammy's holding this 95 any, and what can he do with it, right? Yeah, he could stake it, but why would he accept that as as normal ETH? And the reason why is because in the case that there's like two scenarios in the way that this all plays out. So one scenario is that Omnia defaults. Now Sammy's left with this with this any, um, and what can he do with it? The answer there is that if Omnia defaults, then the spot pool will liquidate into that any pool, and Sammy will be able to go and exchange all of his any one to one for ETH with no problem. Um, if this if Sam if Omnia didn't default, that means that he had to go out and purchase either purchase the NETH back from Sammy because you need to pay back your loan in NETH or he minted new NETH with a one-to-one -one backing um, in the pool, in which case that means that there will be enough ETH sitting in that pool for Sammy to go and reclaim all the ETH that that NETH represents. So while it's not always true that Sammy will always be able to go and claim the exact amount of NETH, it is true that at one point he will, always, he will never be left holding a bag that he can't um, claim from. And so that basically allows us to now use uh, this NETH as a derivative of ETH that's completely backed by spot pools without having to have an ETH pool lingering uh, for lending. Um, and so what we're going to do with that lending module actually um, is that we're going to make it completely open source. So anyone who wants to build a lending protocol on top of Abacus will have access to this NETH, uh, to like the minting of NETH, basically using this lending module as a proxy. Um, and then they can they can enforce their own interest rate. They can enforce um, their own LTV, any of their own parameters that they'd like, they'll be able to enforce. And then this lending module just adds as like, uh, or acts as like a, uh, a pipeline for them to be able to access that any. And uh, this is, this is probably a dumb question. I'm not sure. Is is there a reason that you guys chose um, like ETH as the the synthetic thing to issue instead of like a, a stable coin or something like that? Yeah, because we don't want to be reliant on any sort of oracle in that way. And mm -hmm. so, if you were to issue a stable coin, you'd have to have an ETH to stable coin oracle. Yeah, right. Um, that makes sense. So we just decided to kind of stay away from that. Yeah, I would also. I, I don't know if anybody else is doing this in like the NFT NFT space, like issuing stable coins against um, NFTs or anything. But it seems like the uh, illiquidity and volatility of NFTs could serve like a lot of issues too for like trying to issue a stable coin against them. I guess you just have to be like really conservative with the LTV. Yeah, I mean, also the thing the thing with NFTs, right? Like, so I mentioned that Ben Dow saga, right? And so then, like, a, a question would be. 
Like, so what, why is Abacus any different, right? Why would Abacus make this whole craziness that's going on and this looming threat of apes just imploding right now? What, what would it do to solve that? Um, and the answer there is that what happens with Abacus is let's say you had um, 280 apes all being collateralized by Abacus, right? Because you can, you can create a pool that collateralizes a thousand board apes. So let's say you had 280 of them. Or you had a thousand, a pool with a thousand of them, and you know you have two hundred eighty of them. All of them are that need to liquidate. So right, you're about to liquidate two hundred eighty apes in one shot. So what happens currently is there's like this idea of like this recursive cratering of the value, which is that I liquidate a, I liquidate an ape. Someone comes in to that auction, pays a distressed asset price for it, dumps it below floor on the open market to to capture that that kind of spread right now floor gets hit now all the other apes that are currently being borrowed against the value of all the floor of all of them have, has, has now gone down and so now any apes that were on the fringe or on the margin are now basically uh, at risk of getting liquidated now ape number two gets liquidated someone gets it distress asset price sells it below floor on the market, floor goes down, same thing happens again. And now you have this with five or six or seven of them, which is what is at risk right now, of like 50 of them getting liquidated. Um, and what happens is, is that there's not even enough, even if like the price may be right, there's just not enough liquidity sitting in the market to even catch them. And so now that distressed asset price is much lower than it was before which means they're willing to sell it on the market for much lower as well, which dumps the floor even more. And then that just thing just happens and happens and happens and things go really bad. It's so the literally difference a death spiral. With, yeah, literally a death spiral. Um, and a death spiral due to illiquidity and this like this like uh, recursive check on the market that you're dumping on is what you're checking you know, for the Oracle price. And so... What Abacus does in that way is that, let's say back to the case of having a thousand pieces collateralized, right? What would happen is, is that, let's say you wanted to dump the entire supply of apes that, that Ben Dow has currently. So 280 of them in one shot. Did we lose him? DG. Yeah. Can't hear him. Rip. <laughs> All right, oh, we'll, we'll wait for a sec. Uh, I'm going to come back. Yeah, could you imagine like NFTs death spiraling because of uh, leverage? That'd be kind of wild. I mean, it already seems like it doesn't take much to, like, I guess depending on the, the type of NFT that you're borrowing against or uh, the type of NFT that you're speculating on, but I imagine it doesn't take much to, like, move an NFT market in the event that, like, the floor starts falling out. Like it seems like a death spiral is like imminent at that point, but I don't, lit yeah, I like literally NFTs. don't know anything about NFTs. So, <laughs> but with like NFTs, markets like that, uh, the bounce they, back they must also they, be the same. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like the volatility is ridiculous, which is why like some lending protocols like drop style, for example, have needed to program like certain outliers because it's so easy to game. Like, so, so like floors are so easy to game sometimes. Because all it takes is like one to three people or something like to absolutely just nuke a floor. And the reason this happens is particularly because all, all it takes is a lower floor price, right? And like, that's why lending protocols need to smart up and really just see like, yeah, we can't rely on like what the open sea or any other secondary marketplace floor price is. And it needs to focus on certain outliers apparently. So there's formulas as to how to go about it. But um yeah now some are focusing on traits as well so it's just it's just pretty crazy honestly but again like death spirals can literally happen every day um and they do happen every day and they can happen to the biggest collections with pure ease so that's pretty crazy as yeah, opposed yeah. to like your favorite DeFi protocol it's very hard to happen to yeah it takes like sense. hundreds of millions of dollars if not billions of a massively coordinated effort and yeah it's, it's still very fragile mm. I mean, and and then even in this case of, right, the, the thing is that, um, for example, in this case of board apes, if someone with four board apes wanted to nuke the floor right now, they could just put sell pressure on the floor and the entirety of this thing would go out. Yeah. Um, 
and that's, pr- that's pretty wild. Example of, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's like really, really bad, right? You, how you have like an actual financial market on things that that's the case. And the answer is you can't, right? You can't have these financial applications to work at scale if there's no liquidity in, in this market in general, which is what Abacus is coming to solve. And the way it does that in, in this example of the lending market, let's say, is that if you were to liquidate all 280 of those apes into an Abacus pool, right? What would happen is, is that Abacus would have just take the hits. Those things would get auctioned off. So the market would still get hit, but it wouldn't be like a recursive cratering because those things that are being borrowed against are dependent on Abacus appraisals, which don't move. No matter if you if you have a thousand collateral spots and only 280, if, if, if even 700 apes were, were liquidated into it in one shot, the appraisal does not move. Right, just 700 apes worth of liquidity is removed from the pool, and all 700 of those are auctioned off. But that those auctions and that downward price doesn't put an immediate like effect on the value of the pool. What it does is that future appraisers that are coming in at the top values, right, they are going to now adjust their outlook in the long run because they see that 700 apes are about to be auctioned off. So let's adjust where we're willing to come in and appraise that based on what we think the value will be after all of this is said and done, as it should be. Mm. And so, yeah. Go, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. I suppose the question now becomes, um, so the, like for example, like as price is falling or as people are seeing that this massive amount of apes are liquidated, like uh, the ETH that's in the pool, it's not locked, is it? Or is it? Okay, okay. It's locked locked for one epoch, which is a month? No, so people can decide you can lock for as short as three days and you can lock for as long as nine weeks. So, yeah, what I I suspect will happen is that um, you'll have, like, the earliest tranches will be longer term and the higher you get in value, right? So as you start approaching closer and closer and closer to that, like, perceived actual value, of the, of the NFT in the case of a distress sale, the lock durations will get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And so those things are more likely to fluctuate as time goes. Um, for example, like in the case of this liquidation, if all these are happening, then people are less likely to refill those um, and just more likely to like leave them empty because they're like, all right, it's not worth this anymore. So let's not go back in there. Got it. I, I think this is a really perfect segue now that we're talking about locking ETH and, and uh, we spoke a little bit about locking or like interacting with the ABC token. Like, uh, how do you envision this somehow like being incentivized or like the flows of, of capital in Abacus being incentivized using hidden hand? Using, using what? Oh, hidden using hand. hidden hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a few ways that these things can happen. Um, so one of which is that is that there's like the basically more typical bribe mechanism that can happen on like the ABC side. So before even coming into the pools, right? It's like a pretty standard bribe mechanism similar to Curve. Um, however, within the actual pools itself, the way I could imagine hidden hand working in the same way that it works currently with like you know certain Curve S mechanics is that you have um, basically you have these different collections right and hidden hand you know may decide to add in a parameter of this is the max price that we're willing to go into for any of these collections and then what happens is is that you have people come in and they add in the liquidity and basically ask hidden hand to send it to these different collections based on you know how much liquidity they deposit and all that stuff and hidden hand just kind of allocates it the same way they would allocate the bribes as well um, except the only difference here is you have that extra parameter of, of the price of the max price that they're willing to go into in a pool. Interesting. So I, I guess like, um, so talking about the ABC token now, because this I think has a lot of significance in terms of like hated hand as well. Um, like what potential locks can be done with the ABC token. My understanding is that it can be locked for one epoch, which is a month, right? Yeah. So the way the ABC token works there is that 
Um, we don't have any VE. So the way it works with us is if you allocate your ABC towards a collection or allocate it in any way during an epoch, you are eligible to receive the uh, share, of the proportional share of revenue of your allocation. So what does that mean? That means if a total of um, 100, if a total of a million ABC are allocated to different collections in an epoch, um, and that counts auto allocation as well, and you allocated 100,000 of those million ABC, you're going to receive 10% of all the ETH revenues that were generated, or technically 9% of the ETH revenues that were generated during that, that uh, epoch. That will all go to, to you as the allocator. And that's not counting anything that you guys may receive from bribes that you guys kind of source on your own. Um, and so, that, yeah, the ABC is pretty simple in that way, where you just have to come back. And once every epoch, you just allocate. Um, it unlocks right after the epoch ends. If you do allocate in an epoch, you can't unlock it till that epoch is over. Um, and that's all. That, that's like the, I tried to keep the mechanic as simple as possible and stay away from long-term lockings just to give people the ability to um, go in and out of those lockings if they'd like. Got it. So I guess um, to compare with like another NFT Vi vertical, NFT five vertical that we've been tackling with Florida, where uh, participants like collections, for example, would come and bribe G floor holders or like uh, various whales that want to direct uh, ABC emissions to their pools, would basically bribe G floor holders, and it was done in like a really interesting OTC way. Um, do you see this same thing happening where collections end up seeing the value in in uh, like advocate spot pools built around their collection or like their collection uh, like valued? so to speak, by, by people aping ETH into the platform and seeing yeah. there being some bribe volume from there or like more on the whale side or a mix of both. Yeah. Of so to give perspective, uh, I do see that happening and to give some perspective on why. Um, so we have, let's say we have, we have some market makers who will be working with us. Uh, they're interested in like market making, not just ABC, but spot pools as well and some size. Um, and so for a market maker, or an agnostic um, appraiser, right? They're coming in here. Yeah, sure, they want to have fun appraising, but in reality, we all know they want the money that comes with appraising, right? They want to get paid. And so for that person who's coming in and appraising, um, that agnostic person, so they're not necessarily tied to a collection, they're purely looking, and we have it set up on the site, um, and I'm I'm building bots as well that will tell people this type of information. They are purely looking for where the highest emission rate is. And then once they find that highest emission rate, they're saying, do I, you know, is there a spot open that is lower than what I think the valuation is? And so I think when you look at the collection and you look at what that means for a collection of if someone's choosing between two different two different pools of two different collections. And they now choose mine because I have a higher emission rate than the next one. Um, what that does for the collection itself is it increases the overall liquidity of it, right? Because not only is Abacus able to, to underwrite things, but the reason why it is able to underwrite things is because the owner is able to come in and close on the liquidity in the pool at any point in time. And what that means is, is that Abacus not only is an underwriter of all these loans when people take out this debt in the form of any but it's a market maker for any NFT on the platform because anyone who owns that NFT can close into that liquidity at any point in time. And so if you're not only getting deeper uh, underwriting liquidity because your emissions are higher, but you're also getting deeper liquidity period because your emissions are higher, right? There's a clear incentive there to come in um, and kind of start winning this bribe war and start accumulating this ABC to continue winning it. Uh, for the long run. Um, and we have like certain things in the beginning, which is that like people that come in the beginning um, get a lot of benefits that if, let's say if Abacus picks up uh, and a bull market picks up or whatever it is, right? There's higher and higher and higher demand for these, what's called distribution credits and to appraise and to get these uh, ABC. The cost to purchase the ABC, the cost basis goes up as that demand goes up. And so, Right, people who start now 
uh, will have a huge advantage. People and collections who start now will have a huge advantage over others um, because of this low cost basis. And I think if that flywheel kind of starts and begins, and it does start with market makers in a way, um, then it's like a, there's like a clear benefit there for a collection to come in and actually participate in these bribes at you know at a sizable scale. <clears throat> really quick um, on the uh, ask. yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Uh, never do you want to ask your question for the recording? If not, on the yeah, interview. sure. All right, cool. Sure. Uh, basically, uh, I just wanted to get back into like the way you the your slashing mechanism works uh, and kind of how like uh, your ETH derivative. So, from my understanding, the ETH derivative is kind of like a debt backed ETH, right? They, where people just pay back their borrows, and that should basically uh, keep uh, keep uh, keep it keep it backed a one to one. But if your appraiser if your appraisal price and liquid and the liquid price of the NFTs kind of there's like a large spread between those, especially in the downside, is basically they're slashing, kind of used to uh, as like the backstop for any bad debt. What was that? Uh, the back for me. Like the end part of that, I missed it. The end part was basically is basically the slashing used uh, as like a backstop for the bad debt. If there's like a big uh, like spread between your liquid the liquid price of the NFT and the appraisal price. Yeah, I mean, so that's right. That's like the the ethos of advocates is to basically take this thing that is incredibly hard to price and do what every other asset class has ever done, which is create a public market for it, right? Look at equities, they have a public market to price those, debt, they have a public market to price those, all these things. And so that's just what's going on with advocates, right? So by someone coming in and appraising at some value, they're taking the bet, just like the person who buys a stock is taking a bet or buys a token is taking a bet, that it's at or higher than that value, and that's why they're buying it. And so if they come in and buy it way above a price, you know, way above the actual liquid market price, that's on them for mispricing it. And so they should be, you know, they shouldn't be rewarded for mispricing it. Um, they should be slapped, right? And so when that actual liquidity comes and this liquid and the actual liquid price is realized, um, then that's when, you know, that's when the protocol is able to basically decide whether or not they were correct or whether they are incorrect and whether they should be slashed or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So if, when they're wrong, uh, I guess they get slashed, and that's like the gap between the, the liquid price and the appraisal price of the part of the uh, of the market. So the the, exactly. the ETH is actually always the ETH is always backed. So well, um, as we move towards towards the end of, of this section of the call, um, I guess I have a, a bigger like meta question for you, Medici. And as you guys are thinking about like NFT finance, how far along uh, do you do you think NFT NFT finance really is, and do you think like Abacus is like a really good next step to sort of maturing that sector of, of the industry? Yeah, I mean, so the interesting thing, back to that, that earlier thing, is that I think more often than not in crypto, we very quickly get ahead of our skis, right? So we get, like we see what was built in the last markets, all this lending stuff, and all these like you know, these different derivatives and everything. And everyone wants to build those for NFTs. Um, and so it seems like this NFT finance market is booming, which maybe it is. But in reality, none of that actually works without liquidity, right? Not, none of it works with, without a liquidity pool or some sort of uh, liquidity attraction. And the, the, the trick there is that the liquidity attraction cannot be through um, exposure to directly holding this nfts right the bet can't be that we are going to make we're going to just make these things like these things are illiquid but somehow people are going to put so much money into them that they will now become you know liquid on their own merit with people speculating on them like purely from people speculating on them right and speculating to a point where they will sell their money and hold it because it's it's not that's just not the way it is right and it likely won't become that, at least for a very, very long time. And gotcha. so what Abacus does here is basically bridges that that gap, um, which is that you can come in and actually speculate on the value of the NFT. And the holder can use that speculated value of the NFT 
but the person themselves who is speculating has no exposure to actually ever holding the NFT, which is the important part. Their exposure is, okay, I priced it properly, so I speculated on it properly, and now I'm getting this reward that Abacus is using to bootstrap this appraisal service to continue going, right? And so now you have that bridge, at least this is what I look at it as, which is that bridge created of, we have this liquid token that we'll give you for appraising and speculating on this illiquid market. And in doing so, that illiquid market now has access to this liquidity that it didn't have before. And now all those financial applications can operate as they would before, right? Because there's this looming massive, call it a market maker if you'd like, or massive liquidity pool if you'd like, whatever it is, right? Because that exists, now all of these, all of these things are empowered to work without super high risk, right? Without these mass, like without these like 15 to 30 or 40% interest rates that are required on, on you know, borrowing against an NFT at super low LTV as is, right? And so that's kind of the, the more macro goal and what, what I think, uh, I hope advocates will do because I, I don't think that NFT space can really move forward as we've seen currently with this bend down meltdown, it's not, it's not on bend down, by the way. I think they're great. It's just the, the state of the market that is now having to absorb that. Um, I think that that is like a clear indicator of a need for whether it's something like Abacus or if Abacus is not it, something else that will basically aggregate that liquidity. And um, Sisyphus said it best, which is that when all this uh, altcoin stuff with Kobe was going on where he called them altcoin with pictures. <laughs> Sisyphus basically made the point, which is that if this is the case, which it might be the case that they trade like it, whether they are or not, whatever that's for whoever to debate. But the point is that if that's the case, liquidity is the most important thing, right? It's the most important thing to making this, this market go uh, and function properly. And so that is the bet that we're taking at Abacus, which is that we are going to be that that vehicle, which is completely permissionless. Anyone has access to it in terms of using it. Anyone, anyone has access to it in terms of participating in it. There's no guardrails. There's no none of that. Um, that we want to basically be the thing that empowers that entirety, right? And, and basically powers this world of NFT finance in that way. Um, so I do think it'll make a big difference. It's just a matter of like, the one variable is whether liquidity falls into place and it's seemingly starting to. To, to put it lightly awesome well yeah thank thanks for for hopping on um amia was there something you wanted to throw in really quickly yeah um really quickly i think it was it was really interesting to me to hear uh Medici come and speak so thanks a lot for that um i i think like just a cherry on top has been really interesting to see how <clears throat> like for those i remember like pre DeFi summer um this is very reminiscent of that moment uh, like pre comp liquidity mining, like pre urine and all that stuff. Um, I feel like Abacus changes that completely for the NFT space. And like for the sheer size of that, you know, of the current NFT market, without a serious tool like Abacus, it's, um, you know, if we're like supposed to take <laughs> like the, the comparisons from a, from a growth perspective, like from DeFi to NFTs, after there's a tool like that that exists, then I think we're in for a pretty incredible ride. So I'm very happy like we we at Redacted are, you know, not only have we seen this, but we've we've taken action to make sure that we that we're not only part of that, um, but growing right alongside it. So Dope, we're well. happy to have you guys growing with us. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. And and like I mentioned at the start of this, uh the recording will be up for you guys to share. Um we'll transition to some redacted stuff now. So if everybody wants to keep up with Abacus, I think you can go to abacus.wtf, the the application itself is not live yet but they have twitter discord etc uh, so you can go get involved in the community and keep up with i'm assuming the development process until, until it's ready to to actually go live so thanks again medici for for taking the time to hop on yep, yep. thank you guys for having me anytime Bye. anytime peace bro all right, so uh, I feel like I'm a little bit smarter about NFT stuff. I mean, I was already pretty smart, but now like that we talked to somebody who's working on it, I'm a little bit smarter. Um, cool. So you are now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for everybody who uh, missed it uh, really quickly, I think a couple of votes just went live. I mean, we can um, maybe even 
or not went live they completed um i don't i don't have snapshot pulled up i don't know funky if you were keeping track of whether or not they passed or failed or whatever but if you go look at the snapshot there were a couple of uh snapshot proposals that completed during this call um if you missed them just go check it out if you didn't vote make sure you vote next time we get some snapshots up we want to make sure everybody's uh participating and stuff like that um can we make an exception for late voters unfortunately no so um the other the other governance update that i left out at the beginning of the call is that we are pushing for uh, a new curve gauge on the new butterfly v2 eth pool um, so this would mean basically the previous gauge gets deprecated and that the um, new pool gets a new gauge so i think right now it's just kind of in the rfc stage where we're getting like feedback on it or uh, however the curve part of that works uh, there's the proposal there so if you have any like positive feedback or anything you want to leave without brigading it please feel free to do so um funky is there anything any timelines and stuff that we need to be aware of on the curve gauge proposal uh not really um i think because of the deprecation we might have to just check with the curve team to see if we need them to launch the vote as opposed to us launching the vote um directly through their ui okay. but um everything's kind of ready to go and i think as you were saying three of the proposals that were uh still live at the beginning of the community call have now finished so there's the um rl butterfly mission schedule which will be kept as is um there's the um aura uh locking proposal where we'll be locking all of our aura that we receive and rl butterfly holders will forego the aura uh eth that they would have received um small amount though so kind of a small difference for our butterfly holders but instead they get um higher future uh revenue from the treasury as the treasury will be earning more um and the last one is the um nft pink's nft proposal which unfortunately didn't pass dope um so yeah uh thanks everybody who participated in those votes always helpful when you have like a good turnout so you get a good gauge for the type of stuff that people want i also recommend like if you voted no for a particular proposal proposal and maybe it didn't it didn't pass like the nft one i'd be really curious to know what people's feedback are right like i, I think there is some value to uh launching a redacted themed nft project it's just about coming to the right terms um and so, you know, Pink is active in the Discord. They're always open to feedback and stuff like that. So uh, if you have any feedback that you think would be helpful for them on like maybe reproposing it or, or something like that, uh, I think that'd be pretty cool. So uh, please do that. Um, moving on to Hidden Hand stuff. I think this week was another, yeah, super thick week for, for bribes. Um, I'm sharing the, the Dune dashboard. So it looks like there were four hundred and eighty one thousand five hundred and fifty two dollars in bribes this week which is like insane uh the bulk of those coming from aura and lido uh with badger coming in hot uh this week i don't know if it was their uh no they did they came in hot last week as well so two weeks in a row badger has come in with pretty large bribes last week it was eighty thousand this week it was about sixty eight thousand uh gnosis coming in with ten thousand um and yeah, a couple others. So pretty sick. Um, the, the bribe revenue on Hidden Hand is just going up as well. I think like the balancer and aura markets are really hot right now. So if this is if these are the numbers and like a, a pretty stagnant market, all things considered, then I, I think the, the bull markets are, are good prospects for for Hidden Hand. Also, you know, we're starting to expand into different verticals. We just had Abacus talking for the last 30 minutes. Um, they plan to integrate Hidden Hand and have an active bribe market. So there's all of these like different opportunities out there for hidden hand. So it'd be cool to see like how bribe markets mature and heat up over time across all of those different verticals. Like balancer, I think was one that was uh, relatively unexpected. Uh, we knew there'd be bribe volume there, but the size of the bribe volume, I think it is actually pretty surprising. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything else to add on, on the hidden hand side. I know we, we actually, actually we have something going out on the hidden hand side today. Um, I, do we want to say it now for the call or do we want to say, save it for yeah, later we, we, already, we already leaked it last last week right okay yeah so um never maybe you can walk through uh what we're what we're launching on the hidden hand side today we're just going to be launch we're going to be launching uh like uh, a mirror market of Vialora uh on on optimism so bribers can now br uh, bribe Vialora holders on optimism uh so that we can capture a lot of the op and uh, kind of v2 tokens I mean, L2 tokens that uh, are kind of don't have any liquidity on L1, 
It also makes it easier experience for people to uh, for people to kind of claim uh, like uh, with very little with very little gas. Yeah, it's kind of our first first you know planting the flag on optimism. So yeah, starting with Aura, and then we will be moving uh, spreading across you know uh, optimism. No, and do you mind touching on the rewards forwarding piece of it as well? I know we have a, a doc oh, yeah. that I'll share, but yeah, it's it's in the documentation. But since most like this is mostly concerning DAOs and multisigs, since uh, basically and contract wallets. So maybe some users, you know, with a bit larger kind of funds might use a contract wallet as well. Uh, but your L1 address might not be the same as your L2 address. Uh, so we we suggest users to, it's on the UI, there's a notice when we launch it to basically to, to forward their rewards to, a, to an EOA so that uh, they can claim on uh, L2 uh, without any problems. Because, yeah, <laughs> what happened to, what was that fund again? Uh, that was supposed to get a huge amount of OP that, that messed up. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, was it a fund or a market maker? Was it Jump? Oh, the market maker, yeah. No, it wasn't. It Jump. was Wintermute. Oh, Winter Mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're multi sig on Optimism. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> we're not talking about this amount of money, but let's say if you're a whale, you're going to get like 100 grand worth of uh, worth of reward, like uh, 10 grand worth of rewards. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's very cheap for someone to just replay tech and get your address and claim it for you. <laughs> and yeah. And instead of so, you. So yeah, we so, have a full document. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. So like never just said, we have it in the documentation. Uh, it'll be part of the announcement as well, so people can can easily find it. Um, I, even if you have no idea whether or not you should be doing it, just check just in case um, as, a, as an abundance of caution. Um, when will it be launched? I mean, like pretty much, uh, I think, after this uh, call, which could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be any day after this call um, soon. But um, cool. I think if that's all on the hidden hand side, I think, Things are on the up and up. Uh, I think we have some new markets pending, like the Abacus one that we just touched on. So whenever they go live, that'll go live as well. Um, and then for the Pyrex and Dev updates, we have KP, the Wolf Slayer, on the stage. Um, he can walk through everything that he's been working on on that side. Uh, before he does, though, I just want to let everybody know that we're quickly approaching 1 million CVX deposited into Pyrex, which is a sick milestone. Um, it looks like we have my math is correct, like 28,000 more CVX to go. So if anybody has 28,000 CVX left uh, left in their wallet, feel free to deposit and get us across the finish line there. But anyway, KP, you can take it from, from here. Thanks, Colton. Man, you, uh, they say that the first million is the hardest, right? So, and I, and I do think that's gonna be the case here because um, I mean, the more capital that's deployed or deposited, or I mean, value that's deposited and remains secure. Um, yeah, I think it's just, you know, people were shy, we're not shy, but cautious the last uh, over the past few epochs, and and they just wanted to to wait and see, um, you know, uh, how things would go. And um, yeah, we feel really good. So. But yeah, I hate to disappoint you. I mean, there's not a lot of new updates. I mean, right now, we're just really heads down and working. Um, we did uh, finalize, or we've been, I think mostly finalized the next two Pyrex protocols that we're gonna be doing. Um, yeah, as I mentioned in the past, like we, we just, uh, we really took the time to deliberate and you know, think deeply about you know, how these protocols uh, will evolve in different, um, over different time periods and I think the new the next two protocols, um, which are going to be built in, in parallel, by the way. So right now we're we're just completely focused on on the next. I mean the current. I mean Pyrex protocol number two, um, and then after that, myself and Seiji will branch um, or or separate, and we'll be we'll be tackling two protocols at once. And um, yeah, I think that's yeah. So yeah, exciting. But yeah, I, I think I'm just, this is just a lot of fluff because yeah, there's not, there's I'm not. I'm going to see updates. how many times he says, yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's like keeps going Who knows? Like, for like 15 minutes to fill the gap. Um, <laughs> no, nothing. Who knows though, bros. We might, we might Pyrexify uh, ABC. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's, that's definitely. Pre, that's as Colton calls it, uh, pre-alpha alpha. Jesus. Damn, this guy's alpha for the future. Never yeah. even. Uh... <laughs> 
I mean, Omni right, is literally but... just making shit up, so don't, just don't worry about him. Um... What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Banner, oh, bro. Um, what is the... Just uh, Loso asks, just what's... Bro. Yeah, bro. Alpha he... from YouTube. Like... <laughs> uh, somebody asked, what's the second protocol? You know we're not going to leak that. Um, well... Yeah, you'll see <laughs> well... <laughs> Yeah, well... Dude, come on, two weeks? Yes. I... You'll okay, see right, whatever no, you'll see whenever you see uh, what the what the next one is. What is the Dude, uh, these guys are I trash, bro. They're up here just player. saying don't listen to anything anybody says. The only timelines that are real are the ones that I say, and the only next projects that are real are the ones that I say. Anything else, they're making it up. Um, psyops. Yeah, it's all just psyops. I mean, I think something that could be cool, uh, Carnation, if you're around a mic and and want to wax poetic for a little bit, I think. Uh, People haven't really met you yet, so it might be cool to walk through some of the stuff you think through at Redacted and what you've been working on. All right. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Carnation. Um, I've been with Redacted since uh, June, but you wouldn't believe it. Um, so, yeah, we've been talking to a lot of different partner protocols um, without giving away too much and coming up with new ways that we can take advantage of um things that people haven't really explored yet. And mostly those revolve around like, um, how do we come up with yield faults that uh, really don't subtract from um, anything, you know, like whether that's yield being paid out to users or that's like um, decentralization and security of the protocols we participate in. And hopefully, um, you know, we're literally talking to everyone. So um, there, there are a lot of really interesting things we think we can do. Oh gosh. Uh, I hate talking like this because there's a lot more I want to say, and hopefully, you know, it's always soon TM, but um, we're just waiting on KP to wrap some things up, and then we will have a lot more that we can share. But yeah, nice to meet y'all, and if anyone ever wants to ask me something, I'm very happy to just shoot ideas around, because that's literally all I do. There's no alpha for any of you today. <laughs> yeah, nobody, get, nobody gets alpha today. Yeah, I think I think if anybody has crazy ideas too and wants to like work through them, like if you have an idea that would be sick for Pyrex or like a crazy yield strategy or something, Karna is the one you want to run it by. They've like they just constantly do crazy strat stuff in the redacted Slack. So I trust Karn to to come up with a bunch of cool stuff in the future, and I think that'll help uh, shape a lot of a lot of strategy around product in the future. So it'll be cool to to see that all of that come to life. They've been working on a ton of ideas alongside like funky and percival and stuff like that so you yeah, want to the current protocol that we're working on right now yeah so cool ideas the the to under the bus just like yeah we're waiting on kp but have all these other <laughs> protocols we're expecting out but fuck holton save me bro yeah you have to go faster i mean okay the thing is everybody so uh pretty much no no jokes from kp today um last time he yeah i didn't cut it from the community call but he deserved to have it cut from the community call but uh the thing is i've been letting kp build a lot on his own i haven't been helping him and uh things are moving a little slower than expected so it's like it is what it okay. is can i share a little bit of alpha yeah so yeah sure. just it's like okay no, go ahead go ahead why do ducks have tails to hide their ass clacks <clears throat> All right, well, now that we got that out of the way. Um, it, <laughs> yeah. There was a time yeah, for crickets. crickets. I, was <laughs> I wish I had a soundboard. Yeah, just <laughs> cricket. I was clapping. That was funny. Never you were clapping, your mic didn't pick it up. Did Sa Sammy just went into the audience. He was so annoyed by that joke. That's funny. Well, Sammy, if you want to come back up and if you have anything to add to the end of the call, you can. Um, I don't. I don't know um, if you wanted to touch on anything today. The there was the um, voting issue. We never um, like the pending locks thing. Participating in governance. Did we oh, right. did we fix? It? Uh, so our snapshot was like similar to VLCVX, uh, where we were listening to kind of the lock balance. So kind of excluding expired and pending locks, uh, which you know usually makes sense. But since butterfly naked butterfly still has governance, it kind of uh, yeah it kind of rendered people that had pending locks at a disadvantage. 
uh, since they weren't able to uh, interact with governance. Uh, so for the next uh, voting rounds, we will be allowing pending and expired locks to vote. Yep, so that issue is going to be addressed next time. Um, as far as I know, I, I, I mean, I'm sure that was like the minority of voting. I think it affected only a handful of users. So uh, that, that'll be solved the, the next time we have votes ready to go. So a little bit of an oversight, but we're good to go now. Um, anything else we want to touch on at the end of the call? And if anybody has any questions for us, then we can also answer those. If not, then we can wrap it up a bit early today. Uh, so hypothetically, if we were launching a second Pyrex wrapper, when would that hypothetically be? So if we were hypothetically launching a Pyrex wrapper, a, a second Pyrex wrapper, we would hypothetically launch it soon, TM. Um, tell us a joke, no. I don't, I don't joke around, I'm serious all the time. So I'm not a little joker that jokes on stage. Um, cool. Uh, if we have nothing else to add toward the end of this call, then we will wrap it up. And if not, yeah, all right, we don't. So nobody's talking. So cool. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, make sure you check out advocates. Make sure yeah, you check out the. We to, did we mention to go vote on the new curve proposal? I don't think the vote slide, but I told them to go look at it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, cool. We got everything covered. We're good to go. Um, if you're late or if, uh, I guess you're listening, uh, if they're listening to the recording, they can't be listening to this. So I'll have the recording up ASAP, um, on the new YouTube, YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to it, go subscribe to it. We actually have a lot more video stuff that's coming out. Uh, we already released two tutorials. It's the official YouTube channel. We're going to have more shit on there. I mean, stuff on there. So go check it out, but thanks everybody. Have a good weekend.